All right, here we go again. Jason Schreier is back at it with another one of his Bioware investigative articles. In case you don't know who Jason is, he's the Kotaku editor who broke the story about Mass Effect Andromeda's troubled development, among many others. Jason's been one of the best sources of insight into the inner workings of the gaming industry, and now he's giving us a look into what's going on behind the scenes of Anthem's development amidst concerns of potential predatory monetization schemes and speculations of a troubled work environment. And here's what he found from numerous Bioware sources. His article kicked off by reporting a couple things. One, Bioware, normally a multifaceted studio multitasking on multiple projects, has pooled all of their manpower and resources into Anthem over the past couple months. While small teams are still working on maintaining titles like Star Wars The Old Republic and working on the next Dragon Age entry, for the most part, staff from Bioware's Edmonton and Austin divisions are all working on Anthem at this point. Two, while Bioware announced at E3 2017 that Anthem would launch sometime in fall 2018, Jason's sources confirmed that the game will be delayed until sometime in early 2019. If you're suddenly getting a sense of deja vu, that's because something similar happened with Mass Effect Andromeda, a game that was originally supposed to release sometime in late 2016, before it was delayed to early 2017. One of Jason's Bioware sources also said that a fall 2018 release window was never a realistic goal to begin with, and that an exact date still remains in flux, meaning that they haven't nailed down exactly when in 2019 they plan to launch the game. It was noted, however, that EA is unlikely to allow Bioware to delay the game beyond March 2019, which raises some red flags for me, as it could be indication that EA is willing to push the game out half-baked for the sake of meeting deadlines and pleasing investors. If I were EA, I would give a major release like Anthem all the time it needs if they don't intend to repeat another Andromeda incident, even if it means taking a short-term financial hit. And three, there is apparently a sense among Bioware employees that the company's entire future rides on how Anthem performs. The article further elaborated by stating that while it isn't unusual for Bioware to pull staff from other projects as a game enters the final year of production, something they did for Andromeda and Dragon Age Inquisition, it feels different this time. The stakes feel higher than ever before. And one developer told Jason that they believe if Anthem doesn't live up to EA's expectations, Bioware will look very different in the future, especially considering how Andromeda's failure led to EA absorbing Bioware Montreal into their EA Motive studio. In other words, Anthem is make or break for them. If it succeeds, there might be a future yet for Bioware, but if it fails, Bioware might be next in line to be sent to the chopping block, following in the footsteps of studios like the recently departed Visceral Games. That's what absorbing a studio really means when it comes to EA. They suck out a studio's soul and deprive it of its games and some key staff, after which they spit out the remaining husk. Pressure only mounted further following the Star Wars Battlefront II loot box fiasco and the numerous Destiny 2 controversies. While sources involved in the project expressed that they're optimistic about making something good, they also said that they feel anxious about all the forces pushing against them, likely referring to early rumors and concerns that are already beginning to circulate. There are also those close to the Anthem team who criticize Anthem's development for remaining in pre-production for a very long time. The game's development officially began in 2012, and you may recall that it was originally spearheaded by Casey Hudson before he left Bioware in 2014 and then came back in 2017. Much of that time was seemingly spent conceptualizing the game. Those sources who are veteran Anthem staff noted that it's not unusual for a big new franchise to have a long development cycle and a long incubation period. However, Jason also pointed out in his article that throughout 2014 and 2015, he had heard rumors that Anthem's development wasn't doing so hot, in large part due to the studio being forced to use EA's Frostbite engine that makes development for the types of games Bioware creates an excruciating process. After all, the Frostbite engine was originally designed for action games like Battlefield, so while it handles shooting mechanics and graphical fidelity really well, it's a huge pain in the ass 
to repurpose the engine and have it work for large-scale open-world titles with RPG systems. EA forcing BioWare to use Frostbite was a major part of why the studio had such a hard time bringing Dragon Age Inquisition to life, and why Mass Effect Andromeda released in such an unpolished state. Coders pretty much had to rebuild everything from scratch to make Frostbite work the way they needed it to, and it turned out to be a major setback. The same technical setbacks seem to apply to Anthem, with Kotaku stating that it's not hard to find a developer willing to complain about Frostbite. Though it was noted that in more recent years, attitude in the team has shifted from a this game is screwed mentality to a game development is really hard mentality. I don't really know if that's all that much better, but anyway, I think the point is that there are still struggles to be had, but things at least seem to have progressed as Bioware has become more acquainted with Frostbite Engine. Speaking of struggles, the past year at Bioware was described as tumultuous, and this had in large part to do with some major changes at the studio, among them being to reboot the fourth Dragon Age game, codenamed Joplin, to which EA planned to implement more of those pesky, live elements into the game. Now, it's unclear whether the game was rebooted in response to backlash against Battlefront 2's live service model, or if there was some other reason, but it seems as though EA has no intentions on shipping the next Dragon Age game without some recurrent monetization scheme, though Kotaku noted that it's not clear what a live version of Dragon Age might look like. Two Bioware sources did insist, however, that the next Dragon Age will still have a heavy focus on characters and story despite live service elements. Oh boy, all I'll say for now is that I have a bad feeling about this. The game can have all of the stories and characters at once, but it'll remain a cause for concern as long as there's a remote chance that EA's live service model will mar the game's potential, as it's done time and again with other EA published titles. On the topic of Star Wars The Old Republic, there are apparently talks about potentially ending development on the MMO altogether, since it hasn't really performed to expectations. The article then shifted back to talking about Anthem, once again emphasizing that all hands are on Anthem's deck at the moment, citing how even staff members such as Dragon Age executive producer Mark Dara were moved to Anthem. Jason also mentioned other sources of anxiety for the development team, such as Mass Effect Andromeda's failure, Bioware studio head Aaron Flynn's sudden departure from the company, who was replaced by the returning Casey Hudson, and widespread anger over Battlefront 2's microtransactions and loot boxes. The Battlefront 2 fiasco in particular has left Bioware on edge and led the studio to re-examine their plans for microtransactions and future titles, though Anthem's microtransactions plans are still up in the air apparently. Jason did add, however, that from what he heard, they might stick to cosmetics only, though I wouldn't start breathing a sigh of relief quite yet. Keep in mind that Destiny 2's microtransactions and loot boxes were mainly tied to cosmetics, but they still managed to be insidious enough to ruin the entire experience. So cosmetics only or not, at the end of the day, how intrusive microtransactions and loot boxes are depend on how they are designed and integrated into the game. So the jury's still out on Anthem until we play it in its final form. Speaking of Destiny 2, Anthem developers have apparently been keeping a close eye on the turbulent circumstances surrounding the game, which has instigated ire from the community due to a consistent lack of substantial content, a consistent lack of transparency, and a constant focus on the abhorrent Eververse microtransactions marketplace. There are also some within Anthem's development team who have expressed concern that their game may also face its own growing pains, as all persistent action games do, with Jason's article citing games like Destiny, Diablo 3, and The Division as examples of persistent action games that had to recover from a rocky launch. One thing I'll say is that just because other similar games have had rocky launches, doesn't excuse a game having a rocky launch. While I'm not expecting absolute perfection from the get-go, the games that Kotaku listed made some baffling blunders, omissions, and decisions that go far beyond mere growing pains. If Anthem has any intentions of kicking off running at launch, 
it needs to learn from the mistakes of these titles and ensure that the game is feature complete and polished at launch and then expand from there. Finally, Jason's article concluded by discussing some Anthem developers' concerns with toxicity, particularly YouTubers who they claim are spreading misinformation and inflammatory rhetoric about EA that have a demoralizing effect on those people on the ground level. The devs told Jason that, quote, to the people who work at EA, the publisher isn't just a cold corporate master. It is a complicated machine that, yes, is concerned first and foremost with generating revenue for investors, but also supports thousands of people in many tangible and intangible ways. Jason was also told that people close to Bioware, along with many other developers Jason has talked to in recent months, are worried that commentary from some of YouTube's loudest voices has eliminated nuance and made companies like EA seem like Disney villains. In retort, this is what I'll say. I don't claim to be an expert on what happens during game development, and I'm sure there's a whole other world and perspective to this that I need to glean to get a better understanding of why some of these game publishers choose to do the things that they do. But speaking as a consumer and a passionate gamer, what I can say for sure is that there is nothing nuanced about the way titles like Battlefront 2 and Destiny 2 were handled. There is no nuance to how Battlefront 2's entire progression system was based around pay-to-win loot boxes. There is no nuance to locking iconic Star Wars heroes behind exorbitant grind that strong-arm players into purchasing loot boxes. There is no nuance to saying that this was done to give players a sense of pride and accomplishment. There is no nuance to how Destiny 2 throttled XP and Faction Rally tokens. There is no nuance to Destiny 2's lack of substantial content and abundance of microtransactions and loot box items that are mainly comprised of lazily rehashed and reskinned cosmetics. There is no nuance to locking old vanilla content behind an underwhelming new DLC. There is no nuance to repeating the same mistakes over and over again, and there is no nuance to not taking player feedback seriously until there is massive backlash after you've pissed them off enough, after you have poked and prodded them one too many times. In the eyes of consumers and gamers, these are just blatant monetization tactics at the expense of player experience, plain and simple. I get that companies have to make money and all that, but there are ways of doing that without being utterly shitty about it, without annihilating a game's integrity. If they want to explain the nuances involved in employing such predatory practices, I'm all ears, but from where I'm standing, there is very little about manipulative monetization tactics that feel in any way, shape, or form nuanced. Look, I don't get pleasure in the knowledge that talented and passionate ground-level developers over at BioWare are feeling demoralized and anxious, especially considering that a lot of this stuff is out of their hands. But developers and publishers have to understand that gamers are also feeling demoralized and anxious about how games we care deeply about seem to be prioritizing monetization over fun. We were all incredibly excited for the gorgeous and mechanically solid Star Wars Battlefront 2, but the game's loot box-based progression system, among other things, made it very difficult to have fun with it. Many people were excited to see how Destiny 2 would learn from its predecessor's mistakes and take the series to new heights, but instead it regressed on numerous fronts, and the lack of content and emphasis on microtransactions deprived the game of all its fun, with the lack of communication on Bungie's part adding a layer of frustration on top of that. These are just two of the most popular examples. 2017 alone was host to so many exciting titles that suffered a similar fate. I remember there was a time when gamers used to look forward to third-party AAA games when the label represented hallmark titles of the highest quality and caliber. But now the label AAA has become nothing but a stigma that's synonymous with feelings of paranoia on gamers' part. These days, when somebody hears news that there is a new AAA Star Wars game in the works, the conversation is no longer about how beautiful it might look or how exciting the gameplay might be, it is now about pessimistically wondering what bullshit they'll try to pull this time. I'm not one to encourage community toxicity of any form ever, but I do think that gamers do have all the right 
to express frustration, especially when publishers and developers often seem to be unwilling to meet us halfway, even when the feedback is loud and clear. So to game developers out there, I'm sure the situation many of you are in sucks. I'm sure there are aspects of it I don't fully understand, and I'm sorry that you have to go through all this, but understand that as consumers of games, as people who grew up with games and love this medium so much, we are also feeling disillusioned by the gaming industry's current trend. Show us that you're capable of meeting us halfway, and then we can talk about the nuances and how we can move forward together. Because right now, you're moving in your own direction and leaving gamers behind to bite the dust, or at least that's what it feels like. Anyway, that's all I have to say on the matter. Thus concludes all the information that yielded from Jason Schreier's latest investigative article, and my overall thoughts. With that, I would like to end this news update and discussion video. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you found this video informative and insightful, and if you enjoy my content, consider supporting me on Patreon. It is completely optional, but it will go a long way in helping this channel grow. And to be further updated on all things gaming news, reviews, and discussions, stay tuned right here on Yong Yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Yong out.